Hi, viewers. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. We are honored. Today's guest is a leader of opposition, councillor and former member European Parliament, Shafak Mohammed. Welcome in our show. Thank you, Mr. Nazir. Shafak, please tell our viewers about your early childhood and your education. Uh, well, first of all, I was born in Kashmir. Uh, my father, grandfather all came to the uh, United Kingdom to work here. Uh, my uncle and my father and grandfather all lived in Tinsley. Uh, so I arrived in Tinsley in April 1977. Seems a long, long time ago. So you came as a young child? Yeah, as a four-year-old um, with my mother. My grandma was here as well. And soon after, my auntie joined us. And, you know, like I say, a lot of my extended family now live in, in around Sheffield, Rotherham, Leeds, Bradford, Birmingham. So... After coming here, any memories you can share with our viewers, especially... What, of arriving here or of Kashmir itself? Uh, no, arriving here. Arriving here. Well, when I say arriving here, we arrived at Heathrow, which in those days was the, the main airport, still is. Um, and it just seemed so crowded. You know, when you're used to the countryside and the open spaces and... Uh, the little streams flowing and, you know, seeing the beautiful mountains of Kashmir and then you come to this busy um, city of London, you get on the motorway, you drive up to Sheffield, you get here, you see all these big black factories and smoke coming out of them. And we arrive home and, you know, for the first week or so, I was thinking, when are we going back home? Because I thought we'd come to visit someone. Uh, and then it was, I was told by my mum that, look, we are here to stay now. This is is where we're going to be our home. This is your father. He's not coming back to Pakistan. He's going to stay here. And then I started school, Tinsley Infant School, Junior School, and then ultimately Park House, Secondary School. They were all on one road, Boaty Road, so I just started to make my progression. So I, I loved my time at school. So what was your favourite subject? I used to like maths and geography in particular. Um, I didn't like English language or literature that much, uh, but, uh, you know, I put up with it like you do. Uh, sciences, I was okay, but I never really took a shine to. But it was all his maths and geography, so that's what I did. You know, in childhood, everybody has some ideals. Who was your ideal when you were young? Um, when I was young, obviously, I looked up to my uncle, Razak, who's passed away. You know, he was, re you know, he, he was a hard-working guy. He would always be there for us. He used to walk home from his work and then come and see us every, every nearly every day. We had to he had a keen interest in cars, so did I. And I'd, and he used to have these Toyota Celicas, GTs. So he always had these sporty cars and I used to love getting in the car with my uncle. My mum used to hate his cars because they were all two doors, hatchbacks. And she wanted uh, something more practical, four doors. So she really disliked my uncle's choice of cars, whereas all of us we used to love, you know, my uncle and his cars. And he's always used to have these sports cars. So, you know, in later years, he had a Nissan Bluebird ZX Turbo. So those of you of a certain age will remember that. That was a really classic car. Uh, I'm sure your friends are watching us. They <laughs> must be remembered some good was, memories and you, bad memories. He even let me drive it a few times. And the uh, first time you drive a turbocharged car, petrol, my goodness, it was quicker than anything I was used to. So, yeah. Please tell our viewers about your college days and uni days. Um, so, basically, I didn't go to college straight away. Uh, the situation is such that, you know, my dad said, look, we need, to, we need you to go to work. We can't afford you to go to college. So I actually went on a YTS training scheme. In those days, it was, I worked for 40 hours a week, earning £27.50. So a lot of people say, what? You were getting paid, what, 60, 70 pence? And I said, I didn't care an hour. I was just happy that I got a job. And I worked in Hillsborough for the Sheffield Co-op. And within a couple of years, I was given a full-time job. And then within the two years, I was promoted to a trainee manager. And, then, and often I would be in charge of the entire shop. I would have the keys to everything, the safe, uh, the, all the um, uh, storerooms. And, you know, there'd be staff, I don't know, about 100-odd staff working in that place. And for someone like me, from a background like mine. But I always longed for education, especially my friends. They all went to university. A lot of them they came back and they, you know, it's, it's countless times said to me, why on earth did you not go back to university? You could easily have gone, you know, you were better in, um, you know, you were in a higher group maths than I am and you still didn't go to university. So I, what I what they didn't realise was I was doing um, 
night classes at Loxley College. And so ultimately I went as a mature student to University of Sheffield, um, studying business, studying and accounting really. Um, so I went in 1998 uh, and I graduated in 2001. Um, and I loved my time there, even though at the time I did think and looked at Sheffield University and I thought, my goodness, this is for rich people and I'm not rich. But I'm so glad that I got the chance to go to that university and actually mix with people from different backgrounds. And actually that's what made me the person I am now, actually, if I'm going to be honest, seeing people from different backgrounds and saying, actually, I'm no different from them. They might have had a better start in life. Their parents might be richer than I are. My parents were. But actually, in this country, it's based on ability, not how much your parents earn. So what degree then you completed there? Uh, it was a BA honours. Um, I must confess, I don't know where my degree is. <laughs> <laughs> I've not needed it for the last 20 years. Um, so it's somewhere in the house. Um, on occasion, Sheffield University do remind people that I graduated in 2001. So, you know, when they do the magazine, they always, you know, look at all the famous people they've had. And my name appears in sometimes on the 2001 intake. Do you see any friends across Sheffield City Centre or sometime? Who yes. You with you in college and university? Uh, well, uh, a lot of my friends were not from the UK. They were from overseas. I had a lot of people from Scandinavia. I had a couple of friends from India. One I saw recently, there's an email that came out of Dadu. He's now a chief exec of a company in India, Bangalore. Um, so there's a lot, you know, I had people from Singapore, uh, a couple of Americans. Um, I didn't actually have anyone in my course that I knew from Sheffield. That was the irony. Even though we were here in this city, and that's something that annoyed me, actually, that our young people, we've got a, one of the big universities on our doorstep. And at that time, you know, there wasn't that many people that I knew from uh, my own community in Sheffield that actually went to that university. I hope it's changed now. Uh, I hope people are taking up the advantages and the opportunities that, you know, a university education gives them. But, hey, for my message to young people is, Go to university if you want to, but also there's other opportunities like apprenticeships. So, you know, they're just as good. And it's about what you want, and that's my message to parents as well. Let your children choose what they want to do rather than you forcing them into they have to be a lawyer, they have to be an accountant or a doctor. Because you know what? Not everybody's suited for that. So at what stage you decided to join politics? I, a university. So when I was at university, I was... Uh, you know, there's different societies, and I just took a keen interest in politics, not personality politics. So, you know, it wasn't a case of, I'm going to join this party because my friend or my relative was in. So I looked at different parties, and the Lib Dems were the ones that kind of, you know, resonated with me even now. You know, I'm a strong advocate for civil liberties, human rights, and at that time, the Lib Dems were really, really keen to promote that, and Simon Hughes was in particular. And then I met some really good people locally here, and one of them was Councillor Gail Smith, who's going to be the Lord Mayor this year. And, uh, you know, I met her at a community meeting around policing and stop and search and, uh, in my view, overzealous policing that was taking place in, uh, as, you know, a part of Sheffield that I was interested in and I was challenging that and Gail Smith was a member of the police authority. So that's how I remember seeing her coming to a police authority, a meet, community meeting and she just came to listen. So which year you become councillor? Oh, right. I then, so I became a member of Lib Dems. I didn't really do anything externally that much. Uh, but I was their treasurer, so I looked after all the money. And then eventually they kind of arm twisted me and said, you've got to really stand. So I stood uh, for election 2002, didn't, weren't successful. But actually in 2004, there was all up elections and opportunities arose in Broomhill. So I was encouraged to go and apply there. There, there was a contested selection there, but I'm uh, grateful that ultimately I was given the opportunity to stand alongside Paul Scriven at Alan Whitehouse. And uh, not many people believe this, but actually Nick Clegg was also around in those days. And um, I remember Nick Clegg, you know, being in the office, helping us bundle the leaflets. And on occasions, he used to go out and leaflet for us. That was before he became an MP. So when you joined the politics, so what was the main reason? Because everybody has a philosophy, mm. especially joining a political party or a politics uh, there was a, anything going around, especially when we talk about the issues with the immigrants or any issues? Well, I was always, always, always interested in the local community. So I was chair of Tinsley Forum for a number of years. So I got to see how politics worked. I got to see how local councillors worked, how the council worked. I came to a view that there's suddenly so many demonstrations you can do outside the town hall. Uh, but if the people inside the town hall aren't listening, 
then maybe you need a different way. And it was suggested to me by Peter Moore and Paul Scriven that actually it's okay you coming outside here with demonstrations with your own community, but actually wouldn't it be better if you sat around the table and actually debating and arguing your case from here? Because at least then we will have to listen to you. So they're the ones who encouraged me to stand. And I realised, you know, Paul, uh, I remember him telling me, look, you might have your heart in Donald Tinsley because that's where you're from, but actually you could do a lot more for the, not just that community, but the entire Sheffield by getting elected. And you don't have to be elected from where you live. Actually, it might be beneficial. Therefore, you should stand in Broomhill. And then any issues that arise anywhere in the city, you've got no vested interest. You know, you're not going to object to a planning application because it's in the back of your house, because you're not a member of that ward, you're a member of a different ward. So you're totally independent when you act here as well. And I actually, that advice was really sound advice, you know, and I really respect Paul and Peter Moore for what they did for me. So when you become the leader of opposition? Um, so the leadership came after 2011 when Paul uh, stood down as leader of the, uh, we lost control of the council and he said, look, I think the group needs a new fresh face, a different direction I'm now going to step back I'll remain as a backbench councillor but I think you should choose somebody else we had a contested election three of the colleagues stood and I'm grateful that I won for our international viewers and especially the students of political science so what is the role in in a council what is the role of a leader of opposition so we're here to hold the administration to account so the leader of the council is Julie Doe I can propose written questions to her that she has to give a written response and I then can have supplementary questions. I also served on the city region um, scrutiny board. I have a monthly meeting with the chief exec of the council and I, you know, you know, you get appointed to various boards and stuff and as leader of opposition, lots of people from across the city want to talk to you, not just your own ward. So basically you're the leader in waiting. So simply we can say that it is the same design or the style which we have in London in Parliament. So it's a similar yeah, style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 you know, in London you have Sadiq Khan as mayor. We chose not to have a mayor here. We have a Lord Mayor, but people need to understand the Lord Mayor is a ceremonial role. They don't have any, you know, decision-making powers. They just chair the meeting of council and they then meet and greet visitors who come to city. The ultimate decisions are made by the, at the moment in Sheffield by a strong leader and a cabinet model. So it's similar. Instead of having just Sadiq Khan making decisions here, we have the leader of council with eight, nine of our colleagues. Um, and we chose that model. We rejected the mayoral. And I still think that more people making decisions is better than just one person. So we move forward. Next step. So European Parliament, how was your experience? Um, it was fantastic. I mean, when you, when you get to a place like that, it's so ginormous that you don't know how to get around and there were ushers there waiting for you. But it's, some, it's something that just kind of, I was always interested in politics generally and Europe as well. Uh, so I was an active member of the campaign to remain in 2016, both the Lib Dems and the Stronger In. And I remember working alongside people from the Labour Party who also wanted to stay. And then when we lost that referendum in June 2016, I then for a week didn't, was thinking what on earth we're going to do. And then a few friends got together and we held a big demonstration outside Sheffield Town Hall. And so many people turned up that we were like, oh my goodness, there's not just us that feel passionate. And after that, I regularly just got involved in a lot of pro-European activity, both in the city <coughs> and out. Uh, so, you know, the European movement organised meetings, I attended those, but also was a speaker at Sheffield Hallam University when they organised an event. Then the People's Vote Rally, they held several meetings. I would be a member of the panel uh, making speeches, answering questions alongside Lib MPs and others. And basically then when the election came up in November, uh, sorry, in uh, May 2019, I, I was asked by my party, look, I think you should stand. I was like, are you sure? You know, I'm not sure about this. You know, can't, you know, shouldn't somebody else stand? And they said, well, actually in this region, you are the most pro-European active person we've seen. Lots of people want to be MEPs, but actually how many got a track record similar to yours? So they said, look, it's not going to be a foregone conclusion. It has to be a contested selection, but we think you should put your names forward. So that's what I did in April. And thankfully, I came number one for the Lib Dems and as a result got elected. So the how, how the decisions are made, Chef, especially in European Parliament? Because people have seen debates on the news yeah, yeah. and on the documentaries. How the decisions are made? So there? you don't go as great UK. So we don't sit as Europe. You know, you're from France, you're from Germany. We don't sit in those groupings. 
we sit in our kind of political beliefs. So the liberal parties uh, sit together under a banner called Renew Europe. Uh, the, the socialists, you know, they, they sit under the SND, uh, the EPP and the, the conservatives from our UK sit with a smaller group called ECR. And then there's all these other right-wing groups and, and left-wing groups as well. So the interesting thing about Europe this time around was that the Liberals previously had 60 MEPs and this time we had 108. So that meant that we held the balance of power. So historically it was the EPP and the SND who would always be the main movers and shakers, but this time around, because we did so well and the French did so well, that they actually had, to, there were 16 of us plus Naomi Long from uh, Northern Ireland and there were 21 French from President Macron's party. And we were the key movers in that Renew Europe group. It was chaired by, or the president was uh, somebody called Dashian Chalos. Uh, not many of your listeners and viewers will know, uh, know of Dashian, but if I told you he was the prime minister of Romania in 2016, uh, and also Mr. Guy Hofstad was also a member of our delegation. And actually Guy, who's a very vocal pro-European, always getting into arguments with Nigel Farage, w would sit one row in front of me. So I'd always be uh, talking to Guy, winding him up sometimes, but also asking him some questions because he was a very experienced. And also Guy used to be the Prime Minister of Belgium. And uh, another note, your personal experience, you being advocate to remain in Europe, mm -hmm. So what was your main, uh, you know, every advocate have a philosophy, uh, a point that, yes, yeah. I want this to be achieved. Okay. So what was your party's philosophy and your philosophy, that I, why I, we should remain in the Europe? I think our main argument was that the world's getting closer together and therefore people are cooperating more, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in the Middle East or even South America. And therefore we've got a very successful trading block here called the European Union. It served our country for 40 years. Yes, we should change it, reform it, but not leave it. So that was our main argument. And my kind of main argument was also that Europe can be a very uh, useful and a force for good in the world, not just in Europe. Um, you know, we, I, what I used to, I remember saying this to Guy, that I, he asked me, he said to me, come on, Mohammed, tell me what you think of Europe. And I said, do you really want me to tell you? I said, look, you've really done well. Europe has done really well for itself. We've secured the peace, you know, France, Germany aren't fighting each other like they have done in two world wars. I said, we've also now uh, secured economic prosperity, not just for the uh, Western European countries, but Eastern European countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain. So Poland, Hungary, Romania, etc. you know, used to be with the Soviet Union. Now they're, they're part of us and, and they've seen economic prosperity. And what I then said to them, look, the challenge for us now is to use our economic clout to be a force for good in the world. So I wanted Europe more to care about human rights, civil liberties in, in, in all the countries that we trade with, to safeguard young people. So we shouldn't have any young person under 16 working in any factories. We should also minimize our impact on the environment so that we you know, don't chop down forests, etc. And we also said, I said, I was very passionate about women's rights and equality. So actually when I joined the European Parliament, I was on a number of committees and one was the Women's Rights Equality Committee, one was about young people's opportunities, it was called cult, culture and education, and also I was a substitute member of the Human Rights Committee as well. So they were like three key areas for me and I have I think I've championed each and every one. I mean the highlights for me, Nazir, have been when I went to Nairobi, Kenya. I'll, I'll go a very interesting point now. Leaving EU, we have seen very emotional scenes and I will link these scenes then subsequently, you've been on a, everywhere on South Asian media. So please quickly tell our viewers, what was that? So basically, I, like I said to you, I'm passionate about human rights. So there's lots and lots of causes from uh, Indonesia, from Nigeria, uh, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, Iran, etc. that we've championed. And the thing that came up for me and my colleagues in December was this issue around the Citizens Amendment Act in India and the NRC, which are really, really important things. If people don't know what they are, they should Google and find out. There's demonstrations even now as we speak. And what really prompted me was the police action, the brutality of the police going into universities and beating students up. And as a result, uh, I asked my colleagues, I said, look, this is really unjust. We should, as a European Union, raise this with our Indian friends and say, this is not what we expect from a trading partner. So I put a, what, what is called an urgency resolution. Um, 
that was due to be debated the first week of January. Then I was told, look, Mr. Burrell, who's the uh, high representative for the EU in foreign affairs, was visiting New Delhi. Would you mind if you waited till the, the, the final week of January? I said, that's fine. If Mr. Burrell wants to go and make representation, I'm happy to, to facilitate that. And then what happened was that the final week co coincided with Holocaust Memorial. And what we saw was that the Holocaust were, was commemorated. You know, we had a powerful speeches from the president. And one of the things she said was that in order for evil to prosper, all it requires is good people to do nothing. And then the irony was that my resolution was tabled and then some members of the parliament were suggesting that we delay the vote and in essence do nothing. So I just got up to the speaker and said, look, you know, why are we trying not to have this debate? Why are we trying to stall the vote? And I was pretty passionate. I didn't have a scripted speech. I spoke from my heart and so many people clapped. And when the vote came, 111 people didn't want the vote to take place, but 356 did. And that wasn't just my Liberals, as I said to you, there's 108 Liberals. So that meant that Greens, Socialists and EPP all and supported the, me. This, sorry for interruption. When the, these things was happening at the same time, there was a lot of issues going around, human rights breaches in Kashmir. Yep. So what was your stance on that? So when the, the Article uh, 370 was revoked on the 5th of uh, uh, August, I was actually in Kashmir and the Pakistan bit. I'd actually gone. So your views might not... No, but the UN has done a report on human rights in Kashmir. It was published on the 8th of July. So on the 27th, me um, and my colleague Arina Vanavisa, who uh, was uh, a, a member of the European Parliament for the Lib Dems in London, who was the uh, vice chair of the Human Rights Committee, myself and Richard Corbett, went to Pakistan with the view of looking at Kashmir, coming back and then making representation to India to say, can we also go? And we visited Kashmir. Richard and Arena returned back on the third, Saturday the 3rd of August. I decided to stay another week to go and see my dad's younger brother and my mother-in-law. And it was just when I was there that this thing cropped up. So as a result, we then wrote an urgency letter uh, to the high representative. And then at the first opportunity we had, the very first thing when we came back in September, the European Parliament's Human Rights and Foreign Affairs Committee looked at was the Indian... Um, Article 370 issue and then later on in September for the first time in about 12 years we had a main debate in the main hall around Kashmir and I was pretty fair I wasn't gonna you know I wasn't you know just saying oh India's bad Pakistan's good I, I said look actually the people who are being drowned out of here are the Kashmiris ultimately the UN has promised them a final say on their status so the, the Indians can change whatever so your stance was the suffering is a humanity. Yeah. So I was whatever saying, their yeah. part is, whether they are on this side or that yeah, side. Yeah, exactly. And I said to them, look, you know, I'm going to be the voice for the Kashmiris here, because they don't have a voice here. You know, people are lobbying on behalf of Pakistan, people are lobbying on behalf of India, but who's speaking for the Kashmiris? So I said, well, I'll speak for the Kashmiris, because I told the, the meeting that I'm the I was of Kashmiri origin, um, the first one ever elected to European Parliament. I hope not the last one. Um, and I said, as a, as a result, I'm going to speak up for the Kashmiris. We're I... running out of time, Shafak. My sincere apologies. Viewers, uh, I have to uh, stop the show because we have to finish within the time. But inshallah, in, in coming days, we will invite you again. Uh, and I hope we will have a more interaction with you. But thank you very much. Uh, time was the, the essence. So That's a problem. Viewers, thank you very much for joining. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Uh, we promise we will invite Shafiq again in our show. We'll talk in details about politics and human rights. Keep watching Sheffield Live TV.